taken from this morning, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And this time I'm going to read just verse 7 to verse 12, take 3. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And of that passage, it's really the first of those verses which I read to you in verse 7, which uh, would be very much the focus of this message today. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. This is the second of a three-part series looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Last week we looked at verses 1 to 6 by asking the question, what is the Christian gospel? What is the Christian message? This is a very, very relevant question. Many, many people in the UK and around the world are asking this kind of question right now. In the UK, recently released was a song which has been called the UK Blessing Song. It's really a prayer, a blessing which is found in the Old Testament and was given by God to Moses for Israel. It's received over two and a half million hits on YouTube. And Tim Hughes, the uh, musician who's put this song together, received an award this week from Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, recognising the positive influence of the UK Blessing Song on many in the UK in these days. The Evangelical Relief Fund, or Tear Fund as it's also known, have recently found as a result of a survey uh, 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 suggesting that 3 million people in the UK have admitted to turning to prayer during the COVID-19 crisis. As well as this, there is usually 5 to 7% of people in the UK under normal conditions pre-COVID-19 would admit to attending a place of worship or maybe watching a service online. Just 5 to 7% of the population. This has rocketed in recent days, again according to a, a survey conducted by Tear Fund. It's rocketed from 5 to 7% to 24%, that's 1 in 4. With that rising to 33%, 1 in 3, in those in the age group of 18 to 34. So far more people are praying right now than ever. Far more people are watching church than ever. And it seems that many, many people in the UK are open to Christianity right now in a way in which they've never been before. At least that's how it appears. The online Christian bookshop Eden reported that in April they saw a 55% increase in sales of Bibles. That is particularly heartening. That not only are people looking at online services, but it seems they're going to the source material, the Bible itself, for themselves. More people are googling right now how to pray than ever before. Now I know this is just statistics, but at the heart of it, it's showing that there is an inclination now towards Christianity in the UK that just a few months ago would have been unthinkable. And many, it seems, are wondering, in the midst of the crisis which we're going through, is there help? Is there comfort? Is there something which will bring us hope in Christianity? Does God have anything to say to us as we suffer? 
Now I decided to call this sermon, give it a title, I don't often give titles to sermons, but I have on this occasion, give it the title, How the Light Gets Out. How the Light Gets Out. I've got to be really honest with you, I nicked that title. Well, not in entirety, but I, I, I pinched a title and sort of fine-tuned it a bit. And the place where I pinched it from was from the, um, the world's largest philosophy and music festival. It's held in Wales, in Hay on Wye, twice a year. And it has its own title, How the Light Gets In. Well, I'm calling this sermon How the Light Gets Out. And that title, How the Light Gets In, the organisers of that uh, philosophy and music festival in Hay actually themselves lifted it from Leonard Cohen in one of his songs, where there's the line, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. But that phrase, How the Light Gets In, which is the title of that philosophy festival, is a reminder that there is a belief often amongst us as human beings that by observation, by questioning, by thinking, by reason, we can work it out. We can open up the cracks in our thinking by reason and critical analysis and we can draw down, download as it were, wisdom for wherever wisdom is kept in the universe and in that philosophy festival there are people from the world of the arts and people from the world of science and politics and even faith all giving their two penny worth in the attempt to let the light come in the bible on the other hand says that the christian has the light And is now to live in such a way that as they live, the light gets out. Now Paul, who wrote this letter to the church at Corinth, was writing it to a church in a really big city. In many ways, Corinth had superseded Athens in Paul's day as a place of learning. And with learning, central to learning in Greece 2,000 years ago, was of course philosophy. The New Testament isn't ignorant of philosophy. When the Apostle Paul wrote these letters explaining and unpacking what Christianity was, he wasn't doing it in a vacuum, no, he was doing it against the backdrop of the ideas of generations of philosophers and thinkers. Pagan philosophers, pagan thinkers. So, for example, when we read of him going to Athens, which most people associate with philosophers, of course, we read a wonderful little throwaway description in Acts 17 about Athens. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Now, we're 2,000 years down the line, but life really hasn't changed very much, has it? Particularly down in lockdown, people are spending more time reading blogs watching vlogs, reading the newspaper, the online comments, the journals, and whatever people want to post, we are saturated with ideas right now. Just like the people in Athens, we seem to spend most of our time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Now, Paul realizes that the latest ideas in the philosophy of the world, the idea that somehow we have to download the light through our own wisdom, that these ideas, as interesting and as fascinating as they were, and sometimes as making sense as they may have been, were at root and at heart a million miles away from what is found in Christianity. So much so that he has to write to the church in in his letter to the Colossians, to three churches in that area, and warn them to Christians now by saying, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human traditions and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. So don't let the ideas of the philosophers spoil you, was what Paul was saying in his day. You see, there is a massive contrast between thinking that looks to get the light in with what we see in this passage that speaks about living to get the light out. 
Christians, you see, far from being those people who are, to use again one of Paul's own phrases from 2 Timothy 3, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth, Christians have come to acknowledge the truth. I realise that can be a bit offensive, the idea that the Christian has found the truth, but it's entirely consistent with what Christianity has to say. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And it's the Christian assertion, based exclusively and purely on what the Bible has to say, that the truth that humanity yearns for and longs for is found nowhere other than in Jesus Christ. And we find it in Christ through what is written in the, in the Bible. It was Augustine who in his own conversion to Christianity, reflecting on it in his book, The Confessions, his remarkable book, it's a spiritual autobiography written as a prayer, as worship to God. In the opening paragraphs of that, his confessions, he writes, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee, O Lord. It is the Christian assertion that the Christian has found true truth. And that that true truth is found in Jesus Christ. So, whilst the Christian is learning through the word of God all of their lives, they are not those who are always learning and never able to acknowledge the truth. No, instead the Christian is one who is learning but has acknowledged the truth in Jesus Christ. Now all of this is referred to in verse 7 by Paul as being treasure. It's valuable. It's precious. We have this treasure, he tells us. The Christian has the precious reality of knowing not only the joy and the wonder of knowing who Jesus Christ is, but knowing that in and through Christ they have something unique. As Jesus himself said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So what is this treasure, this truth? Well, as we saw last week, it's all about Jesus. In verse 4, we're told that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The Christian gospel is all about Jesus. It's not all about church or all about morality. It's not all about tradition. It's not all about ethics. It's not all about social responses to the practical evils in our world. As important as those things are, it's not all about ethics. It's all about Jesus Christ. One of the lamentable things about the Christian church in the Western world, it seems, in recent days, is that when it's opened its mouth in the public arena, it's spoken sometimes about everything and anything other than Jesus Christ. But this treasure Paul refers to is all found in Jesus Christ. He is the treasure. And because it's all in Jesus Christ, we also see that this treasure is not just about knowing who he is, but receiving life from him. For as much as it is all about Jesus, it is also all about spiritual life. Verse 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The Christian gospel points us to spiritually transforming power. Just as God said in creation, let there be light. In the Christian, he has shined his light into their hearts. Just as he brought life to the universe, 
He has given life to the Christian believer. Now if we step back for a moment, this reminds us that right now in the days in which we live, in these COVID-19 world, which is frightening and overwhelming, at least these things remind us that there is hope. There is hope for despair, hope for darkness. There is spiritual life and power to be found in Jesus Christ, which is glorious and wonderful. There is security. What is better right now to know that in all the chaos which is going on in the world right now, with all of its uncertainty, that there is God, and he is almighty, and he is in control of all things, and he is your friend. What is more reassuring than that? You know, there is something quite stunning in the words in verse 6, which we didn't mention last week. Very quickly, let me unpack them for you. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. There are really two things which are being presented there. One is the knowledge of the glory of God. The Christian knows God. The Christian knows God uniquely, gloriously, wonderfully. And the focus of knowing God is, as Paul says, in the face of Christ. In the face of Christ. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Is that just some sort of spiritually romantic phrase that Paul is using as he reflects on the beauty of Christ? No. That phrase, in the face of Christ, is speaking about personal connection, personal engagement with Christ. You see, this was written 2,000 years ago. They didn't have photographs. They didn't have selfies. The only images they had were pretty basic and, and raw. So generally in society, you only ever heard about someone. You heard about the emperor. You heard about the civic leaders in a city far away. You heard about perhaps an athlete in the Isthmian Games. You heard about these people, or sure, people would have described them to you, but that's all you had. But if you saw someone's face 2,000 years ago, it meant you had met them personally. It was the only way to see someone's face. And so in verse 6, when Paul says, we have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, he is saying the Christian is someone who knows Christ personally. Has not just heard about him or received the description that the scriptures give us, but the Christian has actually come to know Christ. They have seen his face. Oh, for sure, not literally. It's a metaphorical use of that statement, the the face of Christ. But it's a reminder that it's been used in such a way to declare to us that the Christian knows Christ personally. Now, this is what Paul is referring to here as treasure. He says this is what the Christian has. The Christian has truth The Christian knows God. And the Christian has seen and experienced Jesus Christ personally. And all that Christ came into this world to do, to live, to die, to be raised from the dead, all of that suddenly in the life of the believer is not just a series of theological observations that they can tick off and say, I know that, I know that, I know that, knowledge, philosophy, no. As vital as knowing those things are, as we know them, something remarkable happens. What is it? Well, Paul described it in the book of Romans in chapter 10 in this way. Faith comes through hearing the message. And the message by the word of God. So as there is this embrace of truth, there becomes the embrace of Christ. And it becomes the embrace of all that Christ has done by his death and his resurrection in the defeat of sin and the bringing of new life. And as the Christian believer through faith embraces Christ, life comes to them. Do you have that? And if you're not a Christian this morning, what have you got? 
Where's your treasure? What is your treasure? Maybe it's your job. Well, that's up the spout right now, isn't it? Maybe it's your hobby. Maybe it's your interest. But that's not looking so good right now. Maybe it's a sense of your control over your life. I'm financially solvent. I have a nice house. We have a nice car. We take our holiday here. The children are fine. Everything's good. We're healthy. Everything's good. But look at it right now. It's all been thrown upside down. The Christian, on the other hand, has an unshakable, incorruptible treasure. For their treasure is found in God. Do you know the best thing? Their treasure can be your treasure. If you will right now trust in Jesus Christ. And not be like one of those philosophers who says, well, we've heard of this Jesus. Tell us more. But it's Jesus from a distance. No, by faith. Look in his face. And say, Jesus Christ, you who came to our world, you who are both man and God, and who died on that cross, to break the power of sin and death. I believe in you. And I want to know you. This is the treasure. But Paul goes on. Not only does he speak of this terrific prize, this treasure, he goes on to speak of what is best described as a paradox. Now what is a paradox? Good question, isn't it? Um, Well, a paradox, according to the dictionary, is a seemingly absurd or contradictory statement, which, when investigated, may well be true. May well be true. In other words, a paradox is speaking about something that appears to be ridiculous, But when you actually examine it, it's true. This treasure. Where do you keep important things in your life? Well, you keep them in a safe place, don't you? Maybe you've got a special hiding place, secure and safe in the home. Or if you have something that's of profound value, you may even invest in a safety deposit box. I look these up on the internet. Banks now are offering this in big cities. And for about 500 quid rent a year, you can rent a safety deposit box. There it is. Locked away, maximum security. Or take something like the crown jewels in the UK. You want to go and see the crown jewels? You pass through a great deal of security. Kept in a safe place. Tower of London. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 is one of the most outrageous paradoxes the world has ever heard about. We have this treasure of knowing God in the face of Christ, says Paul, in earthen vessels it's like saying we keep the crown jewels in a Tesco's carrier bag it's just as shocking in fact it's so shocking it seems outrageous jars of clay were very common in Paul's day you you went down the market you bought a dozen at a time why because often they were chipped and cracked you dropped one you broke it you just swept it up throw it away you get another one it was just a little rude crude basic unattractive receptacle for keeping things in and in verse 7 when he speaks about jar of clay he's speaking about the life of a Christian God has housed this treasure of who he is, his glory, 
in the face of Jesus Christ, he has housed it in the life of ordinary Christians. Now I want to reckon that this morning, this is a challenge for you if you're thinking about Christianity right now. If you're one of the many people in the UK who's beginning to think, has Christianity got anything to say to me in these days? Because quite often, as people watch an online service, or maybe even have a go at reading the Bible for themselves, they say, well, it really does sound good, but actually, if I'm totally honest with you, the problem with Christianity is Christians. Or at least those who claim to be Christians. And if the claims of Christianity are so true, then why are Christians so ordinary? It's easy to look at Christians and wonder about the link between that woman or that man who you know who claims to be a Christian and the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so there is this paradox, this tension. Can it really be true that the living God who made the universe and his son who rose from the dead and the Holy Spirit who brought light out of darkness in the creation of the cosmos now live and dwell in that person. Because there's always the issue of hypocrisy amongst Christians, isn't there? And less becoming behaviour amongst Christians. There are authentic Christians who lose their temper. Are less than straight sometimes. And maybe even downright irritating. In fact, there's a long list of Bible characters who, within whom we see this paradox. There is Abraham, who we're going to hear a little bit about this evening, who was this man remarkably called by God. It speaks about in Acts 7 of how the glory of God appeared to him. As God says, I, I want you to go on a journey and I'm going to make a unique promise with you. And you think if ever there's a man who would live his life 100% full on for God, it would be Abraham. But twice we find him lying as he pretends his wife, Sarah, is not his wife, but his sister. And he embraces deception. Or there's Moses, the great leader. But he has a fiery temper and a dreadful speech problem. David who's described in the Bible as being a man after God's heart, who wrote these amazing psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Beside still waters he leadeth me. Is the same man who commits adultery and murders a man to cover his tracks. Peter, one of the great leaders of the early church, denied Jesus three times we have this treasure in jars of clay early on in the book of Acts they arrested some of the disciples some of the apostles for preaching about Christ and in chapter 4 of Acts in verse 13 we read these extraordinary words when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised they were unschooled ordinary men They were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Jars of clay, unschooled, ordinary men. Nevertheless, inside is treasure. Now it seems confusing and it's not how you would have done it, is it? I don't think it's how I would have done it either. You would tend to think that if what Christianity claims is true, that it's about faith in the living God who made all things and controls all things, and in particular it's about faith in Jesus Christ who has broken the power of sin and death and despair, that somebody who actually believes all of that, well they would be like Superman or Superwoman. A real action hero. 
But Paul is far more of a realist than to indulge in that fanciful thinking. We have this treasure in jars of clay. And this is a challenge for you if you are a Christian, isn't it? Because you know who you've come to believe in. You know that the centre of it all is the power of the cross, is the resurrection. From darkness to light, from death to life, it's an unstoppable power. You know that the power of the cross has and one day will be seen in its fullness to have obliterated the power of evil. And yet you struggle as a Christian. You struggle with temptation and failure. You struggle with shame. You have a great sense from time to time of your own sense of weakness and there are times when great discouragement sets in. You identify on those occasions in the Psalms when questions like these are asked as we get them in Psalm 42. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within you? With Paul's word to the Romans in chapter 7, what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. And you say, I just can't work it out. I know what I believe. I know it's true. I know of the power of God's love. I know of the power of the resurrection. I know I've been brought from darkness to light. I know my sins have been forgiven. But why am I so downcast? Why do I fail with basic temptation? Why do I experience lows and times of great crippling weakness as a Christian? We have this treasure in jars of clay to show Paul goes on to write that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. There's the answer to the paradox. It's all about the power of God. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show, to demonstrate, to parade to the world with all of its apparent wisdom, with all of its apparent impressiveness, that what we have has nothing to do with us at all and everything to do with God. The placing of God's glory, which is precisely what it is, the placing of God's glory in ordinarily struggling Christian people is deliberate. Why is it deliberate? Because the Christian life is not the pursuit and desire to download knowledge as getting the light in. No, the Christian life is about living with struggle and living with weakness and living with suffering and living with difficulty in such a way that the light gets out. And that's exactly what Paul goes on to write in this particular passage. Verse 7, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Uh, the Greek word that's used that we have all surpassing power means to, to throw something beyond. It's as if, here's your power. How far can you throw? You know, you might say, I, I can throw a javelin, I don't know, 50, 60 meters. And it's as if God comes along and says, well, I can throw it to the furthest side of the created cosmos. There is, you see, inside every Christian believer something that will never, ever be 
extinguished. What is it? Belligerence? No. It is the all surpassing power of God. It's in you if your faith is in Christ. Your treasure is in an earthen vessel, though. And so in verses 8 to 9, he says, We are hard pressed. There are times when we are perplexed. There are times when we are persecuted. There are times when we are struck down. But of course, that isn't just what Paul says. He does identify those things. Being hard pressed, being perplexed, being persecuted, being struck down. But in each case, he responds. So in verse 8, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Why? There is this indestructible, all-surpassing power of God that dwells in the Christian believer and in every single Christian believer. In life, for many people in life, being hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted and struck down, they're knockout blows. They end it all. It's beyond them to get up. They never recover. Not so with the Christian. Not crushed. Not in despair. Not abandoned not destroyed. And this is not mere somewhere over the rainbow, optimistic, wouldn't it be lovely, la 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 thinking. It rests on the all-surpassing power of God. So says Paul, as you live as a Christian, in verse 10 he says this, We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus. He was despised. He was rejected. He was misunderstood. He found himself on the wrong side of the world. And Paul is saying that that is what it's like to be a Christian. But that's not all. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. You see, here is the reminder that he who stood before Pilate and was scourged and crucified and died, the death of Jesus, is the same one who on the morning of the third day was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And the same is true with you. The discouragements you have as a Christian, as you're discouraged with the kind of person that you are, the lack of progress you're making as a Christian, as you're discouraged by your own frustrations, your own sense of failure, your own hypocrisy. That's not the last word for you. And it never will be. Why? Just as you carry around in your body the death of Jesus you also carry around the life of Jesus. The resurrection. And it will be revealed in you. Death will not have the last word over you. Sin will not have the last word over you. Fear and terror will not have the last word over you as a Christian. Because you carry within you, you little earthen jar. You carry within you this treasure of the all-surpassing power of God. So as we come to close here this this morning, no matter how weak or useless you feel as a Christian, be confident of this. 
that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And if you are a Christian this morning, your faith and trust is in Jesus Christ. As weak and as near to feeling like quitting as you may be right now, you are going to make it. You are going to arrive safe and secure in the glory of heaven. Why? Because of the all-surpassing power of God that dwells within you. You see, no one in Paul's right mind going into a home and seeing a pile of gold coins in an old, crude, earthen jar would have marvelled at the jar. They would have wondered at the treasure. And maybe that's why your suffering is your suffering. Maybe that's why your own inward battles are your particular battles. Maybe that's why your sense of failure is your sense of failure. So that the glory of the treasure that is Jesus Christ and his all-surpassing power might be seen through you. Let me tell you, I have seen more displays of the glory of God in cancer wards and hospices than anywhere else. I have seen the clearest displays of the glory of God in a body overwhelmed and destroyed by terminal cancer. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And so maybe today the best you can say as a Christian is, Lord, I don't have a clue why you're allowing me to go through what I'm going through. It doesn't make a blind bit of sense to me, Lord. You seem to be overwhelming me with sorrows. But on the basis of what you say here, I'm prepared to believe that somehow in and through my chaos, your all-surpassing power is being seen. And Lord, if that is the case, it's good enough for me. You're not a Christian yet? What have you got? What have you got compared to this? And this can be yours. For this treasure is Jesus Christ who is more willing to meet with you than you can begin to imagine. If you would but come to him right now just as you are. You jar of clay. And let him fill you with his treasure and his glory through believing in his Son, Jesus Christ. Well, may God bless these words to you. Let's talk to him. Let's pray. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you now. Amen.